What does atheism mean? What does it mean to be an atheist? The word atheist is commonly defined as a person who disbelieves or who lacks a belief in the existence of a god or gods. This is the colloquial usage of the term atheism, the one you'll find in most dictionaries, because frankly, this is how most self-described atheists use that term. There are numerous subsets of atheism, ranging from your hard or strong atheism, which holds the position that no gods exist, to your soft or weak atheism, which is simply the state of not believing that a god exists. While this distinction may seem subtle, it's important to recognize the difference between the two, as strong atheism carries with it a burden of proof that weak atheism does not. A weak atheist is making no assertion that a god does not exist, and while a strong atheist is not necessarily asserting that there is no god, the propositional content of their belief, which is that no god exists, does carry a burden of proof, which ought to be met by at least their own standard of convincing evidence in order for them to reasonably hold the position. In an attempt to shift the burden of proof away from the theist, many theists will try to straw man every atheist into the hard atheist position or the strong atheism category. One of the ways they do this is by appealing to philosophy. In the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy's entry on atheism, it will reference what is known as the classical philosophical usage of atheism, in which the word itself becomes synonymous only with strong atheism, recognizing no subsets of atheism or alternative usages. Certain philosophers have argued that because the word atheism is used only in respect to theism, that it ought to refer only to the negation of theism which is the strong atheist position of asserting no god exists. In an attempt to shift the burden of proof away from the theist, many theists will try to straw man every atheist into the hard atheist position or the strong atheism category. One of the ways they do this is by appealing to philosophy. For example, in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy's entry on atheism, it will reference what is known as the classical philosophical usage of atheism, in which the word itself becomes synonymous only with strong atheism, recognizing no subsets of atheism or alternative usages. Certain philosophers have argued that because the word atheism is used only with respect to theism, that it ought to refer only to the negation of theism, which is the strong atheist position of holding the belief that no gods exist. Now, in addition to burden shifting, there are also numerous other fallacies going on here, not least of which is the appeal to definitions. Dictionaries and encyclopedias do not define the usage of words. People do. Words don't have any intrinsic meanings, after all. Rather, we imbue them with meaning when we use them in a certain way. That's how communication works. Dictionaries and encyclopedias are only reference materials, they describe the common usage of terms over time. Moreover, there's an etymological fallacy happening here. Language is amorphous and it's constantly evolving. It would seem absurd for me to argue that every gay person was happy, or that every ass has four legs, simply because that's how those words were once commonly used. The original usage of a word does not become a better usage in contemporary discussion, simply because it's older. By insisting that the word atheist ought to be defined by the classic philosophical usage when someone applies it to themselves, all we're doing is potentially strawmanning that person's actual position. It doesn't matter how the Stanford Encyclopedia defines atheism or what arguments philosophers have previously made in advocating a particular usage. The only thing that matters is what the person adopting the label means when they say it. If by atheist the person means weak atheist, then evoking the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy becomes nothing more than a red herring. It's not that I'm attempting to discredit the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy as a non-credible reference source. On the contrary, it's a perfectly useful one, just not in this context. Because the historical usage of terms doesn't relate to how terms are currently used, nor how they ought to be used. 
Another argument that these dishonest burden shifters try to use in order to force their preferred usage of atheism is to say that the word atheism only referred to the propositional content of what is believed, in this case the existence of a god, rather than the state of believing itself. The idea here is that because atheism is a word that was used in reference to theism, it ought to mean the negation of theism. And it is here that they begin to insist that the word theism implies a god existing. Theism does, after all, come from the Greek word theos, which means god. The prefix a means without, just as it does in other a words like amoral, apolitical, asexual, and so on. So what they're doing here is they're trying to say that if theism implies the existence of a god, then atheism implies the non-existence of said god. But there's two huge problems here. The first being that this entire line of reasoning is invalid. It's actually based on a lie. You see, the word theism does not imply the existence of a god at all because it's not a reference to the propositional content. It is actually a reference to the state of believing, despite what some philosophers have argued in the past. Atheism is a reference to the state of believing in the same way that the word agnosticism is in reference to the state of knowing, not the propositional content of what is to be known. We'll get more into agnosticism in a moment, but this is where the theist argument starts to cannibalize itself. Because going back to the actual historical usage of atheism, and I mean the original original usage, which means without God, we can see that the expression when applied to a person would mean without a belief in a god, which would be weak atheism. There's simply no merit to this idea of appealing to a particular dictionary definition or encyclopedia entry. This is a common type of equivocation fallacy known as the definitional retreat. It happens when an arguer presents a different definition of a term used by their opponent and thereby demands different evidence to debunk the argument. It's simply a tactic that theists use to move away from having to meet their burden, which they know they can't meet. It's also an argument used by certain non-theists who don't actually believe in a god, but want to avoid the atheist label, which in their mind comes with baggage. Many of these individuals fancy themselves enlightened or more reasonable than either theists or atheists. They prefer to identify as agnostic in accordance with the aforementioned reference source identifying the word with some sort of neutral and therefore reasonable stance given that both theism and strong atheism carry a burden of proof. Except that that's not what agnosticism actually means. Now again, words don't actually have meanings, they have usages. But just using their own kettle logic against them, in order to be consistent, they would have to go back to the root word of agnostic, gnosis, which means knowledge, and the prefix a, which means without. Being without knowledge doesn't address the question of either the existence of a god, nor the person's state of belief, which are the relevant questions in theistic debates. More often than not, when someone asks you whether you believe in a god, they're not asking you whether you know a god exists. Rarely does anyone ever ask someone, do you know that god exists? That's just not a common question in either philosophical or theological discussions. Most atheists would assume that nobody knows whether God exists, and they would tend to label everyone as agnostic with respect to the God proposition, whether that person happens to identify as an agnostic or not. There are two questions that we can consider here. The first question is, does a God exist? And this is a question that's only really asked internally. And again, the only possible answers to that are yes, no, or I don't know. The second question, do you believe in a god, this is the question that someone asks of another person. And there are only two possible answers to that, yes or no. Because if you don't know whether you believe in something, then either you don't have a firm grasp of epistemology or you may otherwise have some deficient brain state. Like atheism, there are at least two usages of agnosticism. In the strong sense, agnosticism means the existence of God is unknowable, while in the weak sense it simply means that the existence of God is unknown. While theism and atheism address the state of belief, or lack thereof, concerning the proposition of God, 
Gnosticism and agnosticism refer to the state of knowledge concerning that propositional content. But knowledge is a subset of belief. After all, you believe everything that you know, but you don't know everything that you believe. Telling someone that you are agnostic when they ask you whether you believe in a god is essentially ignoring the question. Agnosticism is not some middle ground position between theism and atheism, nor is it the state of reserving judgment. Many people who use this terminology exclusively describe it as the state of withholding belief, as though beliefs are things that we can choose to adopt or withhold in the first place. But they're not. And even if that was true, if you are withholding a belief in a proposition, you are necessarily existing in a state of not believing that proposition. In the case of the God proposition, that automatically makes you an atheist in the colloquial sense. And by insisting that the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is the only definition of atheism that you recognize, you're now committing the fallacy of appealing to definitions. It's certainly fine if that's how a person chooses to label themselves. If someone identifies themselves as an agnostic, and they tell me that by agnostic what they really mean is withholding belief, I'll accept that. After all, it's not for me to define someone else's position for them, or tell them how words should be used. On the contrary, this is the very thing that they are usually guilty of, which I'm criticizing. But at the same token, they don't get to tell me what I mean when I apply the term atheist to myself so that they can burden shift. I know what I meant, and I'm usually willing to explain what I meant if the person I'm conversing with doesn't understand my usage. From my perspective, neither atheism nor agnosticism are mutually exclusive. Since they are addressing two different questions, one can in fact be both at the same time.